Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about N-acetylcysteine for ADHD. Does that make any sense? As usual, I'll start with the take-home message, and when that's done in one or two minutes, I'll be jumping into the body of the talk. Hmm. So N-acetylcysteine, often called NAC, is FDA-approved for overdoses from Tylenol. It's also FDA-approved as an inhalant to break up mucus in conditions like cystic fibrosis and um, chronic obstruction pulmonary disease. It's also available as a supplement. Its status as a supplement is questionable. I'll get into that in the body. But there have been a number of studies in animal models and also a fair number of studies in a variety of mental health issues using N-acetylcysteine seems to best evidence so far is helping with OCD, depression, probably schizophrenia. Um, it's, there's one single study and a few case reports of it being used for ADHD. And it's thought that its major modes of action are by directly increases glutamate levels, and glutamate levels have been implicated in ADHD, having higher glutamate levels, particularly in the um, sub caudate basal ganglia, um, boosts dopamine levels as well, which is important in ADHD. It also has antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties, and in the dosage range people are likely to take it, it should be quite safe. So, jumping into the main talk, so again, N-acetylcysteine is a mouthful, so most often it's referred to as NAC, which is not to be conferred, confused with the NAC, who are the rock group with the 1979 hit My Sharona, so we won't go into that anymore. So NAC is, consists of cysteine, which is one of the amino acids that it's a basic building block of proteins with an acetyl group stuck on. An acetyl group is just two carbons and an oxygen, three hydrogens. So it's essentially a methyl group and a carbon double bonded to an oxygen group so it's stuck onto the cysteine. Once it's in the brain in the vicinity of astrocytes, I mean, so there, there are enzymes in the brain that cleave off the acetyl group. So N-acetylcysteine, NAC, becomes cysteine, the amino acid. And then a further chemical change, cysteine becomes cysteine, like in the cysteine chapel, except spelled differently. And there's a special transporter on astrocytes. So astrocytes are some of the helper cells in the brain that outnumber the number of neurons in the brain. So there is a glutamate cysteine transporter. So system, cysteine outside the astrocyte gets sucked in, and that results in glutamate being pushed out or pumped out. So NAC is a very effective way of boosting glutamate levels outside the astrocytes, which make it available for acting on neuronal endings. Now, once it's within the astrocyte, that cysteine is converted back into cysteine, the amino acid, and then cysteine is converted to a tripeptide, three peptide a molecule called glutathione. And glutathione consists of um, cysteine, glycine, and a glutamate stuck together. Um, but glutathione within the cell, within the astrocytes, um, is very effective at um, detoxifying certain chemicals. It has a strong role in, the, in, the, in oxidative stress, decreasing oxidative stress. Um, so my talk on mitochondria and ADHD is relevant to this. So it mops up reactive oxygen species. Um, glutathione or NAC itself are involved in reducing inflammation, and there's evidence that glutathione may work as a neurotransmitter itself. It appears to have a special receptor on excitatory neurons. So there's an glutamine or NAC has also been implicated not just in changing glutamate and dopamine levels but also in serotonin levels, probably indirectly through its glutamate connection. Um, so there's potentially lots of ways NAC may be helpful in the brain. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about one of the things we know in detail what it does. So how does it help in Tylenol detoxification? Um, and I'm blanking on the European word for so Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, um, param, I'm blanking on the what Europeans call it. Um, so Tylenol in the U.S. is the number one, the top agent responsible for death from poisonings. And that's including intentional overdoses, accidental overdoses, but it itself of the hundreds and hundreds of chemicals and compounds and drugs out there, uh, medications, supplements, it accounts for, in the last accounting, 8.8%. So almost 10% of all poisonings in the U.S., deaths from poisoning, um, are due to Tylenol. So this is important. Now, normally Tylenol, acetaminophen in the body, is broken down into several compounds which are excreted. Um, a very small proportion of acetaminophen is broken down into a particularly toxic compound, um, toxic to liver cells. It's usually a tiny, tiny percentage of what Tylenol is broken down into, and that dangerous byproduct is normally inactivated by the glutathione that's available. However, if you take a massive dose of acetaminophen, then the amount of glutathione is just simply in a fifth in effective at neutralizing that dangerous hepatotoxic, liver toxic chemical, and that chemical starts killing liver cells. It kills some over the course of a few days, and usually death from Tylenol poisoning takes at least several days to occur. So the liver, unlike the heart or the lungs, you can go for hours or days. I mean, one is the effect on the cells isn't immediate. They don't drop dead immediately. But two is, even though the liver is essential for life, it's not essential for second to second, minute to minute, keeping you alive. So when NAC is administered within the first 10 hours after Tylenol poisoning, the rate of death drops down to 3% or less. The rate of permanent or serious Liver damage drops to around 10 or 12 percent, versus these are people who are already sick and injured, where all of them would have liver damage and a substantial proportion would die. So it's a very effective treatment. I'm, I'll just share an anecdote with you. I, more than a decade ago, a woman I was seeing for medication management, she was in therapy with a very good and competent therapist. She and her girlfriend, the, not the therapist, the patient, got into a fight, made a suicide pact. Both of them took a small amount of opioids that they had and a large amount of Tylenol. Um, the aftermath is not completely clear. Both of them went to hospitals, but they went to different hospitals because they had different insurance. And I'll, the, my patient went to the San Francisco General Hospital which treats a variety of people, but including low-income and no-income people in San Francisco. This was before the days of Obamacare. They did a thorough evaluation, got the history that Tylenol poisoning was important, part of what was going on, and administered NAC and um, treated her successfully while she was still in the hospital and in the psychiatric ward because of her suicide attempt, um, they actually had to let her know that her girlfriend, who had Kaiser insurance, went to the Kaiser hospital and the evaluation there. Because after several, this was half a day after um, Tylenol poisoning, she didn't look ill. She didn't look badly. They took an inadequate history. They sent her home. and. The patient's girlfriend actually died from Tylenol poisoning because it was not taken care of promptly and efficiently. But part of it was that they just sort of looked and decided the patient didn't look sick rather than taking a good history and doing her own blood work. So sorry to go into that, but there's actually not a lot of hard data on NAC and ADHD, as we'll get to in a moment. The other FDA-approved use of an acetylcysteine is a mucolytic, so that means it breaks up mucus. 
Um, so the sulfur group on the cysteine molecule, the, the N-acetylcysteine, is helpful for breaking the sulfur-sulfur bonds um, in the mucosaco, mucosac, mucopolysaccharides of mucus. Um, so it's at a chemical level, it's breaking up the complex molecules, making it easier to thin them out and cough them up. So N-acetylcysteine was actually first approved for um, more than 30 years, more than 50 years ago, for treating acetaminophen poisoning. And that was years after it was available for that that companies started making it as a supplement that you could buy over the counter. But it's been used and sold as a supplement for over 30 years. Um, about two years ago, the FDA was asked to make a ruling because there were conflicting questions as, as to its status. And what the FDA responded was officially in their guidelines, if a substance is first identified as a drug, officially they can't just approve it as a supplement. Um, but they are investigating it further that there are no serious dangers in the dosages that are being manufactured. So they implied that that they would be soon approving it as a legal supplement, but right now it's in a sort of a legal limbo status, and Amazon was asked to pull it from their sites for about a year. It's back on the sites as of, I think, two years ago. Um, so again, that's not because there's anything dangerous that's been found. It's that it was just the precedent of it being first a drug before it was a supplement and readily available. So the FDA has to get special exemption to consider it a supplement. So what do we know about ADHD and, and acetylcysteine? All the sources point to a single study. This was a study done in 2013 at Upstate Medical College of, of New York, um, SUNY Upstate, led by Ricardo Garcia and his colleagues. And it's somewhat unusual. I'll get to why it's unusual. One, it's a fairly small study. They had nine patients who were taking 2.4 grams of an acetylcysteine a day. There were nine at twice that dose, 4.8 grams, not milligrams, and six in the placebo group. Um, to put that in context, the dosages that are used for Tylenol poisoning are usually in the 10 to 15 grams a day. And if you're thinking, am I mishearing grams or milligrams? No, these are. So an acetylcysteine, you need in a large amount, most of the drugs we talk about are in milligram dosages. So when we're talking about 40 milligrams of Adderall, so a milligram is a thousand times smaller than a gram. So these are hefty doses compared to what we think of for most medications, but that's what it is. So what, so what was unusual about this population is that this was done studied in a group of people with lupus erythematosus, so a um, connective tissue autoimmune disease um, that largely affects women. So 95% of the sample subjects and controls were women in this group, so that makes it unusual. They did have thorough screening with ADHD tests scores, and they were clearly elevated and in the range for people who have classic um, from childhood ADHD, but they didn't take any his, um, childhood history of these individuals. So it's not clear whether these individuals had classic neurodevelopmental ADHD or whether their ADHD was a manifestation of their lupus. Um, anyway, these patients were treated for three months, um, three months on Again, either placebo, 2.4 milligrams a day or 4.8 milligrams a day of NAC, and then had one month of washout period, and they were reassessed in terms of ADHD symptoms at monthly interview intervals. Um, there was a substantial and marked decrease in inattentive ADHD scores, and this also brought the total ADHD score down, but they remarked that there was not, they didn't share the specific data 
there was not much impact on the hyperactivity, impulsivity, ADHD subscore. And interestingly, um, the group of patients, the ADHD symptom scores remained substantially improved at the end of the one-month washout period. Um, what else can be said? So again, it's a fairly small sample size. No dangerous side effects came up in this study. How representative this is of the general ADHD population is hard to know. And that's, again, the one single study that is out there as of 2024 regarding NAC in, and ADHD. Now, to bolster that, there are a handful of case reports that have been published of people with ADHD or ADHD in additional conditions who had substantial improvement in ADHD symptoms with the introduction of N acetylcysteine. Um, there are also more extensive studies in depression and schizophrenia and obsessive compulsive disorder than there are for ADHD. And several of those studies looked at patients who had executive function deficits and found improvements during treatment with NAC. This was often largely attributed to boosting glutamate levels. So there's a tiny amount of direct evidence. Um, a larger amount of indirect evidence and a fair amount of basic science reasoning that suggests an acetylcysteine may well be helpful for ADHD. In terms of side effects, by the oral route, um, at, at the massive dosages used for Tylenol poisoning, um, substantial fraction, it's not a majority, but numbers of people have gastrointestinal effects. It smells sulfurous and bad, can cause nausea and can cause vomiting. Um, with some of the injectable forms also used for Tylenol poisoning or the inhaled form for um, breaking up mucus. Some people have had rashes and skin effects in addition to nausea and gastrointestinal effects. A small percentage who get it IV have an anaphylactyloid like response. Um, which gets worse after subsequent administrations. But that seems specific to the IV route. And so this does seem to be generally safe. There doesn't, I, I've certainly seen people with OCD who noted substantial improvement with taking it. I have not seen marked improvement in people with ADHD taking it, but my sample size is really small there. And again, a little separate from the ADHD, one of my questions from this is that there's a huge push in this country, and part of it I think is helpful and useful as a public health measure. Part of it I think is grossly misguided, a huge push to get people off of chronic opioid use for pain. I think there are some individuals who certainly some identify themselves as not having help with any other pain relief and the, the opioid helps and is not leading to problems, but I can appreciate many do run into problems. Anyway, larger and larger numbers of people are being left with something like chronic non anti-inflammatories or chronic Tylenol use. So one of my questions, given that the pharmacologists say that the mechanism for, so we know that Many people who are on long-term Tylenol use, particularly at higher doses, do develop liver disease and damage, and that the mechanism of that liver disease and damage seems to be through the same biochemical mechanisms that it causes acute death and massive overloads. So my question is, should we be giving an acetylcysteine chronically to people who are on chronic Tylenol for pain relief? That's all. So... Stay healthy, stay happy. We'll have a question and answer on this in two days. And if you're welcome to put in comments and questions in the section below.